Welcome! In this series of videos, we will look at the design of systems using the PowerBasic Windows and console compilers. Today we will look at gathering information on the computers in the cluster. Over on my hardware YouTube channel, I've been detailing the work done to create the computers that will be used in this cluster processing project. Today we are going to make a start with the software for this system. On each of the worker computers, there are going to be two software processes, the task service and the task process. What we are going to look at today is the task service and the information it needs to gather on the worker computer and store in the database. This will be the area of the database we are interested in today, the warp core table. In order for the task process to insert this information into the database, there are two things we need to do. We need to gather the information from the computer on which the task process is running, and we need to connect to and insert the data into the database. That's what we're going to do in today's video. So first of all, we have a blank sheet here for a brand new application, which we're calling Warp Core. As normal, we'll put the debug error on while we're developing, and we're going to encode some libraries. First of all, the standard Windows 32 API, and then a few libraries of our own. We're going to assemble this application by picking and choosing a number of libraries with embedded functions and subroutines that we've written in previous videos. So we're going to pick up the date functions library because we're going to be doing some manipulation of dates. We're going to be using the PC info library because we want to pull information out from the machine we're currently running on. And we'll be using some file handling routines as well. Now, depending on the amount of work this particular task has to do, it may well still be running when the next scheduled start of the task begins. Therefore, we'll want to check to see whether the current task process is already running on the computer. So we're going to include another library, which will pick up our processes. This is a very popular SQL Tools product from Perfect Synced. Now today I'm demonstrating with the professional version of SQL Tools, and now I can include these libraries with the distributable files, as these are purchased libraries. But I'll put links in the description below to where you can actually get them or purchase them from. However, I can thoroughly recommend SQL Tools as a mechanism by which to connect to SQL Server databases. It really takes all the hard work out of it. In addition, we're including one final library, which is our generic SQL Functions library, which we prepared in a previous video. These functions sit on top of the SQL Tools libraries and further simplifying the method for getting data into and out of SQL Server databases. So having sorted all our libraries out, there are three global variables I'm going to set up, which we'll use during this program. One variable to hold the path and the name of the log for this process. Another global variable to hold the total number of processors, that's CPU processors on the machine we're currently running, and an array which is going to hold the list of databases we're going to connect to. And this particular project will probably only be connecting to a single database. But it's always good to have an array here so that should you want to add additional databases at some later point, it's quite easy to do so. And we're going to put in one constant which is going to be our database handle for the single database we're going to be connecting to. So having put all those in place, the first thing we want to do is to work out, is this task process already running? The process count function takes a single parameter. In this case, we're using xe name x dollar, which is passing to the function the name of the process we're currently running, the name of the executable. Process count will return a number, which is the number of instances of that process currently running on this machine. 
If the number is greater than 1, there must be a pre-existing process already running. If that's the case, then we're calling another little function called exit app. This purely exits the application. The reason I'm putting this particular function in right at the beginning is we're working on the assumption that if the current process is already running, we should not proceed because the current process is probably doing something in the database and we should really wait till it finishes. However, with many programs, you'll probably come across the time when your process, for some reason or other, stops processing and just hangs. If this is the case, this mechanism can quite happily be a hook to work out if the process is actually still functional. If it is still functional, you can just terminate your process here. If the previous process is not functional, then you can attempt to terminate it. Now we're not going to do that here today, but it's good to have these options set up so that at some point later in the future you can plug them in quite happily. Forward planning is a wonderful thing. We we'll need to create our function to exit the application. This isn't anything elaborate, it's a very simple wait routine. It will print out all operations completed with the date and time, the UK date function coming from our date library. It will print out to the console the text we've just given it. It will then say press any key to, to exit. Now normally when these processes are running in production use, um, there'll be nobody watching the actual process. But I've put this in so that you can quite easily exit out without having to wait the 10 seconds or so it takes for this to terminate. The only reason I'm leaving it on screen for 10 seconds is so that in development time, when you're actually watching it, you get to see what's happening for 10 seconds before the program actually terminates. So, having worked out that our process is or isn't already running, the next thing we want to do, we'll just change the colour of the foreground text in the console. Just to be a slightly more pleasing colour, we want to set up our global log file. Now we're forming this up from the path to the executable, the name of the executable, plus the word logging, and .log as the extension. This will basically be used to record the start and the end and any errors that come up during the run of the process. This is particularly useful during development time. Now, as we don't want data in this file from a previous run, having defined the name of the file, we'll then put a simple try catch block in to kill off the log. So if the log exists, it will be wiped. If the log does not exist, the program will generate no errors. So the next thing we want to do is to work out the total number of CPUs, the total number of processors on this machine. Now we can do that quite easily by populating our global variable with a function that's in our PC info library. And this will quite easily return however many CPUs are actually on this machine. Now if we want to check to see whether that's worked or not, let's just put this out to the log. So we're creating a small function called funlog that takes a single parameter, which is the data we want to put to the log. We're putting the date and time before all the text and we're using one of the functions in our, one of our libraries to append it to the name of the global log file. And we're also putting it out on the screen. So if we put a call to that routine in here, just to see this function is correct, we're picking up our information. And to leave it on screen long enough, we're going to call the exit application routine at the very end to give us time to see it. And there we are, 16 CPUs. So it's quite correct we're picking up the information from our machine. Now we won't normally have this in production, so we're just going to take this line out. So since we're going to use SQL tools to connect to a SQL Server database, the next thing we have to do is to set up the SQL libraries. And there are two functions you need to call here. The first one is SQL authorize. This checks that the license you have for SQL tools is actually correct. The second call is to the SQL initialize. 
This prepares the library for use. Now we can start looking to connect to our database. Now I'm going to set up some local variables here. First one being our connection string. We need to define a connection string which we pass to SQL tools to tell it which database to connect to. I'm using long result as a work variable to pick up the result of the call to the SQL functions. The database name is indeed the database name. The status will be the status of the connection. And I've also put in two variables for the username to connect to SQL and the password to connect to SQL. Now, there are two mechanisms by which you can connect to the database in SQL Server. You can either use trusted permissions, in which case whoever you are signed on to the machine as, whoever is running the process, is who you connect to the database. This does have the advantage in the fact that you don't have to put a username or password within your application. Whoever the process runs as is who it connects to the database as. The other mechanism is actually defining your username and password explicitly within the code. If we were doing that, we would set them up like this. Username and password. And we'll give it the name of the database, we'll populate our array with the database we're going to be connecting to. We're going to call this database Kronos. And we will define the connection string to which we're going to connect to. So the connection string, we specify the ODBC driver, which, which in this case is SQL Server, the user ID, which is our username, and our password, and the database we're connecting to, which is the name of the database here, and the final one is the name of the server. Now as we're connecting to a SQL Server Express database, we have two parts. The first part is the name of the computer the database is actually installed on, and the second is the name of the instance, in this case, SQL Server Express. If we were using the trusted connection method for connecting, again, same for the driver. Your know, words trusted connection equals yes. The database would be the same, database name, but we would not need to specify the username or the password, just the server. So, how do we connect to the database? Now, in the library we had at the beginning, which was the generic SQL Server Functions library, there are some very useful functions to perform just this function. And that's what we're going to be using. So, we're calling the user open DB function. We're giving it the database handle, which in this case is 1. We're giving it the connection string, which we specified above here and we're bringing back a value which is a status. And if this function returns true, then we have successfully connected to the database. If it returns false, then the database did not open. And if it worked, we can then continue to do what we need to do within our application. So we'll log the fact that the database was opened OK. We'll start to do our processing. And once the processing has finished, we will then call the routine in the library to close the database down, getting the status back, and reporting on it. Now, once that's all done, we'll want to close down cleanly and shut down the SQL libraries. So after we get past this bit, we will call the SQL shutdown and we will log to see whether it worked or not. SQL success is a constant within the SQL tools library. And if it returns success, then the SQL library has been closed down. If it returns false, then we were unable to close the SQL library. Now that just leaves us to define the fun process. Now, we've done all this work so far, but we haven't actually looked at the database itself. As you'll see from the connection string, we're actually connecting to this machine, this server, and this instance of SQL Server. So let's remote connect onto that machine 
to see what we've got. We're now remotely connected to Quad 1. So we'll just bring up SQL Server on this machine so we can have a look at it. Right, we're now into the SQL Server Management Studio and we are going to connect to this machine and SQL Server Express. You don't necessarily have to be running the Management Studio on the same machine that contains the SQL Server database. They can be on separate machines. But for the moment, we're connecting from the machine itself. If we connect to this and have a look at the databases, we'll see that we do actually have a Kronos database. Now, there's nothing actually in the Kronos database at the moment. There are no tables, there are no store procedures, there are no views. So, just the database. We do, however, have our Kronos login already set up. So if we change the name of the database so it attempts to connect to something that does not exist, and if we run that now, we'll find that it throws an error message up to say it's unable to open that database, which is quite reasonable because that database does not exist. We should get the same response if we change the password. Again, we cannot connect. So if we return our username, password and database to what they should be and attempt to run the program now, we will see that we can quite successfully connect to our database. So what we have done today is we've created an application which can connect to a SQL Server database using a specified username and password or a trusted connection and it will connect to the database of our choice. What we will do in the next video is gather the key information from this computer. We will then bundle that up and save it into our database. And this will become the heartbeat of the process, which the process monitor can actually use to display the status of the entire cluster. But that's it for today. Thank you for watching.